evening thank you all for being here if you can do it join me in standing and we're going to sing when we all get to heaven verses one and four sing it sing the one cross love of jesus sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We Tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Great singing. You may be seated. Thank you so much. And once again, we sang a song about what we're going to be talking tonight in our topic. And our topic is the future, future events. It's amazing to me how many times in the Old Testament during incredibly discouraging times in the life of Israel, God revealed to them future events. When they were being taken into captivity, God revealed to them future events. Future events from God is oftentimes a gift to us, a gift of encouragement to look and say, here is what is going to be like. And as we consider what the Bible says about our future, it is going to be glorious. We don't deserve it. My land, every time I pray, I thank God for my salvation. I say I'm an unworthy wretch. I don't deserve your dying on the cross and, and coming again alive three days later. I don't deserve that. But thank you for your incredible, incredible love. Praise the Lord. And he has future events planned for you that's going to knock your socks off. Literally. <laughs> let's, let's have a prayer, and then we will get into our lesson tonight. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for your love and your goodness, your blessing, your mercy. And thank you, Lord, indeed, for what you've given to us in our future. Now, Lord, there's an element to where we understand that because you're not limited to this sphere of time, 
that even right now you are enjoying us in eternity future. And Lord, that's a hard concept to comprehend, but we thank you for it. Lord, thank you for your teaching, and I pray that you might bless this evening. Spirit of God, would you open our minds to what you'd have for us? And we thank you for it, for we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight is more of an encouraging lesson. Like I say, oftentimes in the Bible, when God wants to encourage his people, he says, let me tell you what it's going to be like. And let me tell you, it's going to be incredible. Some of us have, most of us in here have loved ones that are already there. Loved ones experiencing the glories, the splendors, the wonders of heaven. They're seeing loved ones that, 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 that they're reunited with. Some have been gone for many, many years. And uh, they are now in the presence of Jesus and enjoying heaven. I envy them. I look forward to the day where we are all together in heaven, and that's going to be a glorious time. But we've got a lot to cover tonight, and so let's jump right into it. Keeping an eye on eternity, we'll come, I'm entitled this, The Unseen Battle. In Ephesians 6, 11, and 12, it says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The unseen battle. The Bible describes unseen forces working in the lives of people today and throughout history whose sole agenda is to defeat God and His people by any means possible. There is a spirit world out there. The Bible describes it, not in detail. And I'm kind of glad that it doesn't. But the Bible talks about a, an unseen spiritual world that is working against us, trying to defeat us, trying to defeat anything that has to do with God and His plan of redemption. Letter A, Satan versus God. Number one, Satan's original form as Lucifer. He was originally called Lucifer. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Now, this is symbolic, a symbolic picture of the devil. This king of Tyrus must have been an incredibly wicked, wicked man because God used the king of Tyrus to picture Lucifer himself. He say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Here's a math problem with a sum. You take this number plus this number, and you get the sum. The sum is that completeness. He filled up wisdom, and he's perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created, which is why we believe that Lucifer, in his original created sense, had something to do with music. He was the musical creation head for God. Thou, verse 14, art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. He was perfect. God made Lucifer perfect. He was an incredible angel with incredible uh, uh, abilities talents and abilities that God placed in him. He was one of the three higher archangels of God. And he says in verse 15, he was perfect in all his ways from the day he was created until iniquity, sin, was found in him. And of course, we know that pride welled up in his heart. He was initially a powerful, talented, wise, and incredibly beautiful angel. Number two, Satan fell by exalting himself as God. In Isaiah 14, 12, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 
How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, notice, I will ascend into heaven, he said. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And then here it is. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. We oftentimes think that Satan said, I'm going to be greater than God. No, no. He just wanted to be equal with God. He wanted to have the same rights to say what he wanted. He didn't want anybody telling him what to do. He didn't need to usurp God. He simply wanted to be equal with God. He promoted himself to rise to a position equal with God, an act of pure rebellion against God. He lost his coveted position in heaven and was, was sentenced to eventually be cast into hell. His original name of Lucifer means morning star. Morning star. Number three, Satan's work today against God and his people. Letter A, first of all, he's a deceiver. Satan is a deceiver. If Satan said it, don't believe it. <laughs> don't believe it. Revelation 12, 9 and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The word deceiveth here literally means to roam, to roam, as from the truth or from safety. He roamed away from truth. Satan's method is through deception attempting to cause people to be diverted from the truth. He simply wants us to get off track just a little bit. He doesn't need us all the way off track. He needs us a little bit off track because if we're going a straight line, he knows if we go off just a little tiny bit here, by the time we get to the end, we'll be way off track. Just a little diversion. Letter B, letter B he's a tempter. A tempter. In Matthew 4, 3, and when the tempter came to him. He said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He's referred to here as the tempter. The word suggests enticing or testing one's integrity to cause it to give way. You're just poking him to see how long he will maintain his integrity. Letter C, he's an accuser. I've mentioned this several times recently, that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. We see this in Revelation 12, 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Accuser. Satan throws charges at God's people as a plaintiff would in a courtroom, bringing up actual sins, both those confessed and those still unconfessed. He uses this method as a means of discouraging God's people, making them feel unworthy to carry on in their relationship with Christ. As I shared with you Sunday, he says, you're not a real Christian because a real Christian would never have thoughts like that. A real Christian would never do that. You didn't really confess, or here's a good one, you didn't really get saved because you didn't say the right words. You weren't in the right posture. You didn't do this right, or you didn't do this right. He's the accuser of the brethren. And by the way, he's very good at it. Letter D, he is a perverter of God's word. Satan is a perverter of God's word. And of course, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, 
we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. <laughs> Some get serious. No, that's not what he said. It's interesting. She misquoted God, and so did the devil. The devil never said, Neither shall ye touch it. But she added that portion, and the devil said, This is a good technique. I think I'll try that. And the serpent said, Ye shall not surely die. Satan denied what God had already actually said and suddenly got them to question God's word. And isn't that an interesting technique to get us to question God's word? Is it really true? Is that really what it means? We today have a multiplicity of translations of God's Word. Why in the world would we need so many translations? Well, it's interesting. You go back to the beginning of the, beginning of the, beginning of the 20th century, the 1900s. Going into the 1900s, from the 1800s, there was this effort to get many more translations out. You say, how in the world could Satan use that methodology getting more translations out. It seems initially it got to be a good thing. Ah, the question comes back from, from the unlearned, hmm, which one is really God's Word? Which is the right one? And, and if I'm not sure I have the right one, how can I trust it? So he was chipping away at people's trust in God's Word. After all, there's some pretty significant truths in God's Word. Well, if he's asking me to do this, this is pretty significant, but if I'm not sure it's God's word, then I can't step out in faith. See, <laughs> Satan is a perverter of God's word. Letter E, Satan is a hinderer of the servants of God. A hinderer. He likes to hinder them. This is found in 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 and 18. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. He is a hinderer. He does whatever he can to be a problem to God's servants. He will attempt to slow down or stop work from progressing and is a master at his many techniques. Why did things happen that way right before we were going to do this for God? We had done more than just start this ministry and this fell apart. Why? Because Satan is a master of throwing problems in, in God's plan hindering the servants of God. Number four, number four, Satan's foe. Number four is Satan's foe. Letter A, Satan is mis mismatched in power. He is mismatched in power. 1 John 4, 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oftentimes, little kids get this impression that there is this spiritual battle going on, and in this corner is the devil, and in this corner is God, and they've got their boxing gloves on, and they're going to it, and for a while, God's winning, and then for a while, he's catching his breath, and Satan's winning. It's back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. Who's going to win this battle, Satan or God, Satan or God? Who's stronger? which is an asinine picture when you understand that in God's infinite power, in God's sovereignty, any finite created being is nothing in comparison. Nothing. It's not like Satan is you know, three-fourths as strong as God is, and once in a while he gets them going. No. How ridiculous. God's God. And Satan is a created, finite being. 
that is nothing to God. He's a little speck. I, go, Psh, I get it with one or two. He is a created being. The power that Satan has has been given to him by a willing populace. We said, lead us, O great one. Now, wait a minute, I don't remember doing that. Yeah, yeah, we chose to sin. It happened in the garden, you see. They chose to make Satan their ruler instead of God. It's just one tree. It's just one sin. It's just one temptation, and that's all it takes because I have chosen to allow the devil to be my leader. And that's how he got his power. We elected him. There's really no comparison between the powers of Satan and those of God. God is infinite in his power and omnipotent. Satan, as a created finite being, had limitations inherently created into him. And this gross mismatch is misunderstood by many Christians, believing there are times when God is at Satan's mercy. <laughs> no, God's not at Satan's mercy. You are. There are times where you are at Satan's mercy because you refuse to accept God's help. Letter B. The believer has access to the protective armor of God. Ephesians 6.13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all power or prayer and supplication of the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Take the armor and stand. Take the armor and stand. This doesn't sound passive. This doesn't sound like God is setting us up to, to lose the battle, does it? This sounds like God is completely equipping us to win the battle. And that's exactly right. Number one, he describes the truth belt. The truth belt. Have your loins girt about with truth. Truth holds everything in its place. It's a reference to God's Word. It holds everything in place. Number two, the breastplate of righteousness. And this is living and doing right by God. It's just doing the right thing. Number three, shoes of preparation for the gospel. This is living to always be ready to share our testimony or the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be ready in all seasons to give a word of testimony for Christ. Your shoes of preparation for the gospel. Number four, the shield of faith. Satan loves to hurl violent, fiery darts of distraction, discouragement, despair, division, and doubt into our minds. Through living by faith and trusting God, those darts are extinguished. He takes his dart and he throws it at the most vulnerable, vulnerable place in your heart. That place in which you're struggling with at that particular time, that's where the dart's coming. Well, what does the shield of faith have to do with it? The shield of faith is trusting that God is stronger than that and saying, I have victory in Jesus. I have victory. I'm going to wield the shield of faith right now. What happens to that, that dart? It comes and bounces off. Or, or if it gets stuck in us, the shield of faith whoosh, quenches it. Choose to believe. I'm going to believe what God says. Not what I'm feeling right now, because quite frankly, I'm feeling very discouraged. I'm going to believe what God says. And as I believe what God says and take steps of faith according to God's word, whoosh, there goes the fiery dart. Number five, the sword of the Spirit. God's word is the sword of the Spirit available to defeat the advances of the enemy. This sword is both offensive and defensive. It protects and it charges. 
Number six, prayer and supplication. In these two words, we are instructed to both communicate with God in a worshipful and praiseworthy manner and bring our needs and those of others to Him. Prayer becomes an effective weapon in spiritual warfare. Oh, God, please, please, would you answer this prayer? There's spiritual warfare going on. You are fighting the good fight in Him. Roman numeral 2, the guaranteed victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. Christians sing as a corporate song, but I wonder how many of them have accessed that victory. You know what I'm saying? We live in a world of Christians that are completely consumed by addictions. You see, drug addictions are not limited to the unsaved. Neither is addictions to pornography, bitterness, gambling, lying. Whatever the sin happens to be, Christians can be addicted to that. And yet, we read about victory in Jesus. He died on the cross, was buried, and stayed buried. No, he rose again three days later. That's the whole hope of our, of our salvation, his resurrection power. And it's accessing that resurrection power that we find victory from addiction. 1 John 5, 4 tells us faith is the victory over worldliness, over those things that are found in the world. What is the answer? It's faith, choosing to believe that Jesus has already won the victory. And stop being discouraged. Oh, I blew it again. Oh, I can never, ever, 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 ever get over this. That's the problem. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. And where there is no vision, the people perish. So we find great strength in our faith that God has given to us. The guaranteed victory, letter A, we are currently in the church age. Acts 20, 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. We live in the church age. Number one, as such, the church's commission. Jesus established the church, and we're going to live in the church age until he raptures the church. So that time from Jesus beginning the church until the rapture is the church age, and we are privileged to live in that incredible time. The church's commission, Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. From the very beginning of the church, Christ's mission for it was to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. That mission has never deviated from that time. Jesus told his disciples, Go into all the world and spread the gospel, all the world. Number two, the church's surroundings. <laughs> we live in an unparalleled time in history. We who live in the church age, it's incredible. The blessings and opportunities that we have, the freedoms that you and I share in this great country to share Jesus Christ. We have the freedom in many places to go door knocking. Now, more and more, we'll find an apartment complex, no soliciting. So, oh no, now what we do? Well, at least once a year, hopefully twice a year, we flood the region with flyers through the, through the post office. We pay this exorbitant amount so that we can hit those places we can't door knock on, trying to affect the entire community with the gospel. But what kind of a surrounding do we have? 2 Timothy 3.1. Paul says to Timothy, who I believe at this time was struggling with some discouragement in the ministry, he wrote, This know also that in the last days, those days in which I believe we are living, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, 
traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Doesn't that pretty much describe what you see on the news every night? Sure. The church age lives in this kind of surrounding. Yes, we have access to all these glories in Christ, the ability for us to share the gospel, but the world's not getting better. It's getting worse fast. Letter B, we, believers, will be raptured. We will be raptured. And number one, raptured means to be caught up. We will be caught up. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, this would be a really spooky thing if it weren't so fast. It's going to happen so fast we won't even recognize what's happening. But if it were slow motion, can you imagine? Slow motion. All of a sudden, the earth starts quivering. And then slowly, the earth rises. And out of all these graveyards, the bodies start coming out. Out of the ocean, bodies start floating out of the, out of the, out of the ocean. All these places, all these bodies slowly coming up, and they start to levitate above the earth. And we look and realize, well, you're levitating too. As we're, it's not going to happen like that. <laughs> we're done. It's just that fast. It's going to be so fast, not time to get scared over it. But the twinkling of an eye, that's so quick that we won't even know what's happening. Raptured means to be caught up. Um, then, 17, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a glorious promise. Believers will be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds. That's coming, folks. That's coming. Could be tonight. It could be before I finish this lesson. It could be at any time. Now, that's glorious news. I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait for the rapture. I played trumpet some up until high school. I played trumpet. I like trumpet music, some of it, but I wonder what it's going to be like to hear that trumpet. Can you imagine that heavenly trumpet? I'm wondering if he's warming up his mouthpiece even as we speak right now to play that trumpet. When he does, just like that, we're gone. We're out of here. That's good news. Bad news is all those people we should have witnessed to. See, Good news, we're out of here. Bad news, this old world we're going to see shortly is going to be ushered into seven years of literal hell on earth. Letter C, no, number two, the rapture, the rapture is the blessed hope for believers. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Blessed hope. Letter C, believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. What's going to happen during those seven years? Those seven years of tribulation we're going to read about just momentarily here on earth. What's going to happen to us? Well, you and I are going to be involved sometime during those seven years in what the Bible calls the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we, believers, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. This is a judgment for believers, not of sins, though. It's a judgment of our works. Were your works done with selfish motives? If so, they're going to be burnt away. But if your works were done for the glory of God, they're going to last like, like gold and silver and precious stones. They're going to last. And those are the ones for which you'll be re rewarded with rewards that you'll be able to cast to Jesus. To, to, uh, to, to honor him. Letter D, God's judgment will fall during the tribulation. While we, believers, are being glorified in heaven for those seven years at the judgment seat of Christ, on earth will be literal tribulation. Number one, for seven years, great troubles will come on earth at God's judgment. Matthew 24, 21, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor never shall be. It will be something the world will, has never seen, nor will ever see again. It will be so horrible. Number two, 
By the way, you can't hate an, a person enough to want them to have to endure the tribulation. You say, I sure hate so-and-so. No, you can't hate them enough to want them to go through these kind of horrible, horrible events. Number two, in spite of God's obvious judgment, men will still reject God. In Revelation 16, 9, and men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Revelation 16, 11, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of the pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. During the tribulation, man can still turn to Christ, but the greatest percentage of them will refuse to out of bitterness to him. And they will reject him. Number three, God will raise up two witnesses to powerfully preach the gospel. In Revelation 11, 3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Three and a half years. These two will win many to Christ. Most of their converts will be Jews, but most will continue to reject God. They'll preach. They will win scores of people, many, many people, mostly Jews, to Christ. But most will continue to still reject God. Letter E, Christ will return at his second coming. Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. This one truth describing Jesus, that when he comes back, his eyes were as a flame of fire, puts Jesus in a completely new understanding. We grew up in our Sunday school classes watching the steps of Jesus here on earth, and he did such amazing miracles and was so gracious and so meek and so helpful, and he healed the sick. But there's coming a day where well, Jesus will come as lion, where he will come to rule and to reign. And he will not be that meek man that he was then. He will be come in all of his glory and all of his power. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Hallelujah. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And who do you suppose is going to be riding those white horses following him? Uh, even you don't know how to ride a horse, you will then. Somehow, between now and then, we're all going to learn, learn how to ride horses. I don't know how that's going to be. Verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him and with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat up on the horse, Jesus, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The Antichrist will establish a one world government and religion during the tribulation. Those forces will unite when Jesus returns to war with him at the Battle of Armageddon, and Christ will decisively win that victory. Letter F. Jesus Christ will rule over earth for 1,000 years. Of course, we know that as the millennium. Revelation 20 and verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ 
a thousand years. Isaiah 65, 25, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. I was talking to Randy about wolves. They're going to be releasing up there in, in, in the Burns area, up above Eagle, where, we, where we're praying for a pastor there, the Eagle Church. The government will be soon releasing wolves into that region, and the wolves will multiply. And the wolves travel in packs, and the packs just get larger and larger. Uh, wolves don't currently lie down with sheep until they've killed them and eaten as much as they want. Then they might lie down with the dead carcass. But there's coming a day where those ferocious, carnivorous wolves will have no taste for lambs. Not at all. They'll get along together. They'll play together. They'll be, they'll be domesticated like animals at that time because Jesus is ruling and reigning. Known as the millennium, Jesus will rule as king in his kingdom headquarters in Jerusalem. Letter G, unbelievers will be sentenced at the great white throne judgment. Now, don't get those confused. The great white throne judgment is not for believers. It's for unbelievers. The judgment for believers is the judgment seat of Christ where our sins will not be judged, our works will will. The great white throne judgment, however, is a judgment of unbelievers. And can you even begin to fathom what it will be like to have the accounting of each unbeliever, every sin, every sin, an accounting book for every unbeliever of every sin, every violation, every wicked thought, every evil deed, and they will be held accountable for every one even though Jesus had already paid for those sins on the cross. The Bible says in Revelation 20 and verse 11, And I saw a great white throne. Why white? Because white represents the holiness of God. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Why were they fleeing away? Because that holiness is so bright. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, all their sins, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up to the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This judgment will only be for the unsaved, where they will face their charges and be sentenced and cast into hell forever for their sins. Nothing is said in the Bible about the saved's the saved location at this time, I don't know. I would tend to think that you and I will have in some way, shape, or form a vantage point where we will watch and very possibly see people that we know, perhaps people we were convicted, challenged to witness to but never did, and they will stand before God. They will hear their charges and be cast into hell as we watch. Letter, L, letter H, Satan will be cast into hell forever. This is good news. Revelation 20.10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Letter I, God will create a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21.1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Can I describe all that to you? Not totally. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to seeing it. It's going to be awesome. Revelation 22, verse 1. 
and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. God will create a perfect environment in which we will worship, love, and praise God forever. Hallelujah. Number three. By the way, I hope you understand, I'm doing nothing more than touching the very tops, the mountaintops of these truths. I'm giving you just a 50,000 foot overview of what's going on in the future. The things that are going to go on is just fantastic. Number three is living for eternity. Living for eternity. That's today. That's how we are to live. To live our lives with eternity's values in view. Letter A, share God's good news. Mark 16, 15 and 16, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Time is limited. We must try and reach all we can for Christ before it's too late. Letter B, we will all give an account. Number one, at the judgment seat of Christ. I read it, but in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And I'm telling you this, I would much rather be outler than Vanderhart, because O comes before V, and I'm going to not want to wait around and be so impatient. I want to know. I'm going to want to hurry up. I don't want to be at the end of the line. But you with names ahead of me, I'm going to be eagerly helping. Come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Get out of the way. Number two, crowns will be won. Crowns will be won. Crowns will be awarded to those earning them for various things, that they might be cast at Jesus' feet, honoring him for all he's done, which is a funny concept. Because you think, we go through this life and we live for Christ and, and once in a while, by God's grace, we do th something that is crown-worthy. We didn't deserve it. It's God's grace. He enabled us to do it. Crown-worthy. Whoo! Finally get a crown. I get a crown for all eternity. You're thinking, why would I want to get rid of it? And that's a nice thing for all those who want to cast it at Jesus' feet. But after all, once I cast it, then I don't get to show it off anymore. But we fail to understand. There will be nothing that will give us a greater satisfaction and enjoyment in heaven than doing whatever we can to glorify the Son of God. And as we have, as we have these rewards, to cast them at Jesus, thanking Him for what He did, nothing will give us more satisfaction than that. We say, oh, I wish I could hold on to it. No, you won't. Not then. Not then. You won't be able to wait until you cast it to Jesus. Letter A, crown of righteousness. A crown of righteousness. This is found in 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That's the purpose of the crown of righteousness. To all those looking forward to the coming of Christ. Are you anticipating the coming of Christ? Looking forward to it? Even so, Lord, come quickly. There's a crown for that. Letter B, a crown of life. Crown of life, Revelation 2.10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. This is the martyr crown. 
Now, it's specific to those of the tribulation, but it's very possible that it will be given to all those who are martyrs for Christ. Those, it will be given to martyrs and those overcoming temptation found also in James 1, 12. Letter C, a crown incorruptible. 1 Corinthians 9, 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. This is given for lives lived in spirit control or temperance. Spirit control. Yielded the Spirit of God. Letter D, crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2.19, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not ye, even ye, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? These are given for a life of reaching people for Christ. A crown of rejoicing. Letter E, crown of glory. 1 Peter 5.4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. This is given for leading and teaching people in the Word of God. These crowns will all be gratefully cast at Jesus' feet following the judgment seat of Christ. This is found in Revelation 4.10. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now I will say there's much um, um, difference of opinion on some of these crowns. I just gave you my overview of them. There are going to be crowns given. We are going to cast our crowns at the feet of Jesus. That's the most important thing to remember. We live our lives for him and allow him to give us crowns at his discretion because he's pretty smart, knows what he's doing, and knows the end result. He's going to get them back anyway. And so it's a pretty, pretty amazing opportunity for us to enter in to glorifying the Son of God. Can you imagine? What an opportunity. Whirlwind. Whirlwind. And again, I barely scratched the surface of a life living for eternity. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for your love and your blessing, and I thank you for, for designing for us a most incredible eternity. And Lord, as we read through the scriptures and find these applications of truth, Lord, we realize you don't connect all the dots for us, and you don't tell us all that's going to go on, but what you do share is amazing. And I pray, Lord, that we will live our lives today for eternity's values, with the understanding that what we do today, how we live, how we submit ourselves to you, how we allow the Spirit of God to direct us, how we open our mouths and boldly declare the gospel will affect our future for your glory. Help us, I pray. Thank you, Lord, for we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.